Hey, what's up, everyone? And welcome to another episode of We Need to Talk. Joining me today is someone who is truly changing the way that Hollywood not only thinks, but acts. She's the founder and CEO of Transgender Talent, Hollywood's first talent agency specifically for transgender talent. Her story is truly a beautiful one, and now she's using her journey to help others within the transgender community get the representation and notoriety that they deserve in the entertainment industry. Ann Thomas, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on the on the podcast. Absolutely. I'm excited to talk to you. And just reading uh, your story, I'm really inspired by all that you've done and accomplished. And I've said this to many people that have been on the show before, but I love seeing when someone becomes the thing that they didn't have. And I think that is such a beautiful step to take in your life and your trajectory. And I know in reading, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but in your own experience of being cast as an actor, you realized that there was a need for a safe environment to really foster talent within the transgender community and have them be represented. But before we even get to talking truly about your agency, I would love to know more about your story and your journey of coming into your own and discovering who you truly are. Well, um, I knew I was different before I reached puberty. Um, the thoughts and feelings that were going on there, I had no idea what they, what they meant, what they represented, and realized back at that time there was no, uh, no way for me to get that information, to expand my vocabulary and understanding, uh, because there was not a therapist, and my parents wouldn't have sent me to one anyway, because that was for crazy people, and <laughs> realized this was in the late 60s when yeah. I was feeling like this. And by the time the early 70s rolled around, what did we have as the main thing? Other than maybe news stories about Christine Jorgensen, which I didn't see. I was too young. Um, but I was, we were driving down the road. I remember seeing signs for Rocky Horror Picture Show and asking my mom, what's that? And she's like, you're not going to see that. It's a movie. Oh. you know. And that was really the only representation of transgender that there was, even though we didn't even have that for a name back then. Right, And right. I didn't know uh, what I was feeling and going through. And I was just pressured to conform to the male imagery that was required of people my age in that era. And I fought that. I went to a conservative upbringing in a very conservative church. And I was taught that it was all of the devil or of the flesh and that it was evil and that I had to resist it, and so on. And so, um, basically, I did that. I got married, and so on. So, you know, the, the life that you're supposed to have is a good Christian person. And so, then I just kind of went through life like that, suppressing it, pushing all those feelings out, until finally they started coming back to my late 30s like a, a tsunami. I just couldn't push the, the feelings down. Oh, but I should back up and say that the worst time I had was going through puberty in the wrong one mm. and fighting all the feelings. Then it was insane. I had no idea what was going yeah. on. Nobody to talk to. So, um, especially at that time, I can only imagine yeah. like how isolating and alienating that must have felt. Oh yeah, yeah. Because if you said anything out of line um, in, in a uh, conservative church, you were out the door. Yeah. And so, um, anyway, it's uh, then. I was fighting with that stuff, trying to figure out what was going on with me. I started, uh, this is at the very, 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 very beginning of the internet. And so I was using such wonderful search engines as Alta Vista Digital and um, <laughs> all those ones that nobody's even heard of today. You know, this is before AOL was even popular. Oh, wow. <laughs> and um, so um, I started looking stuff up um, and then. Uh, I started figuring out that I was different and what it, what it was going on vaguely. And I didn't know because at that time I heard about cross-dressers. I heard about transsexuals and I thought, that's really, I don't feel quite right about that. And so I started reaching out, seeking anyone I could find. And there wasn't any place to go even. And this was in Western Washington at the time and then in Eastern Washington. Um, so all those areas, there wasn't anybody I could find to talk to. Um, I really started figuring it out when I was in Eastern Washington. I met a, uh, a fully transitioned, um, older trans woman at the time who'd had all the surgeries years earlier and lived her life pretty fully by then. And when I met her, I realized I didn't resonate with her at all. And I was like, what the hell is going on with me? I thought that's what I was. And she mm -hmm. wasn't, didn't, I didn't feel that. 
then I had the opportunity of uh, going and seeing Eddie Azar perform. And then afterwards, we had uh, uh, the friend that went with me and I hung out at the backstage door until like an hour later, he came wandering out and we ended up having a conversation. And Eddie and I were both dressed as guys. Think about it now. We both have transitioned now. But back then, we hadn't. And we both kind of stood there and stared at each other went, you identify as a woman? <laughs> it was really funny. And so we talked for a while and I didn't resonate with Eddie either. And so I'm like, what the heck is going on in my head? Because this is just not, you know, this is, doesn't make sense to me. Right. Uh, then I started searching further as more and more information started becoming available on the internet. And lo and behold, I stumbled across um, a, uh, an ar uh, an article series done about the first transgender elected official in all of the United States, which was Stu Rasmussen, who was elected the mayor of Silverton, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And so I watched those and I realized that's me. That's mm -hmm. me. I, I, that's, that's me. And so that's who I finally felt comfortable with. He's the one who was using the term transgender the first time I'd ever heard it and related to it. And it made sense to me. And that's when I started adopting it. Now, roll back a little bit before we saw that i was kind of figuring i was just a cross-dresser for a while because that's what was kind of being forced on me by all the information i saw in on the internet and uh about that time my dad was passing away of mm -hmm. cancer he was 67 um and i went to clean out his house realizing he would never be returning home and uh, as I was cleaning out his house, I, I went up to one, uh, to his bathroom that he told me never to go into. And so I didn't, you know, I had a farm at the time. I'm used to dealing with really, really horrific stuff. Um, I put gloves and mask on. This was long before COVID. I put gloves and mask <laughs> on, went to, went up to the door, stood there, took a deep breath and went, oh boy, this is going to be a quite a cleanup job because he is dying of colon cancer. And that's a very messy way to die if you've ever been around somebody with that. And oh, wow. so I was figuring it was just dirty from that. I opened the door. It was full of women's clothes. Hmm. And then I started hunting around the, the, the house and I found all the clean ones, all cleaned up ones. And um, uh, basically, um, it was, uh, it was, it was obvious he was hiding it. And he had nicely neat, neat clothes hung up in the closet. And he had moved into his mother's house. And I looked at the clothes sizes and they were not her size. They were too big. They were his. Hmm. And then there was nicely neatly folded up clothes in the drawers and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, I got to go talk to him. So I, you know, I took a, a few days and drummed up the nerve, went over to his hospital, went into his, uh, into, into the room. And I went over to the bed and I said, uh, you know, after greeting him, I said, uh, dad, how long have you been dressing in women's clothes? And he laid there staring at the ceiling looking like a deer in headlights mm -hmm. and i could tell what was going through his head oh my god my son is going to disown me on my deathbed and i'm like i i paused for a moment to see if he was saying anything he didn't and just stared at the ceiling and i said dad i kind of want to know because i've been doing that too all my life and he oh. just started laughing <laughs> so, it's oh. Like, oh my god he came out to me then and told me what his story. I came out to him. Our stories of how we fought it and how we dealt with it were almost identical. Wow. Um, and so I then came out after that, and that story goes on from there. Um, there's a lot of twists and turns into it. But eventually I transitioned fully with uh, uh, hormonally and uh, legally, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, something like that. Actually, longer than that, probably eight years now. But... Um, Basically, I started this company out of in honor of my dad, yeah. who had wow. to lay the, had to live his entire life in the closet, could not live an authentic life mm -hmm. ever. And he was in major media. He worked for like I've got magazine a magazine here where he did the full article spread for a National Geographic article, um, and so. He was a major photographer worldwide. He worked in, uh, he was a head photographer and on the editorial board of the Seattle PI newspaper for five years. He was 
He worked for a couple of magazines, major magazines, as an editor and then as a managing editor. Uh, so he did a lot in media for years. Everybody knew him. And so for him to hide who he was all those years must have been hell, literally yeah. hell, because he was interviewing. I mean, when he died, we found uh, contact sheets of photo sessions he did with people like Johnny Cash and other superstars. He spent uh, a long time, you know, he interviewed Queen Elizabeth. He interviewed oh, wow. President Kennedy. He knew all these people and he had, he hide, had to hide who he was. Yeah. And then one of the things that he did was when I was, I was born that year of the 62 World's Fair and all the major world leaders were there for that at some point or another. That's how he met a lot of these people initially. Um, he met the Mercury 7 astronauts, and all of them. He spent like four or five days with them and he got to know them and the, he ended up naming me after the two that he liked the most. And so I ended up being named after two true American heroes, Scott mm. Carpenter and Alan Shepard. And honestly, I couldn't go through the legal name and gender change until both my dad and those two astronauts had passed away because I felt like I was carrying a legacy. Yeah. And I didn't want to cause problems or, you know, it just was something in me that did that. And I don't mind hiding that. I don't call it my dead name like so many trans people do. I call mm. it my old name. Oh, I think that's beautiful. And, you know, so. in listening to your story, it does make sense that you would then go on to start this agency in honor of your yeah. father. The whole, the whole story makes sense. And I, my question to you also was, did your dad have sort of the same conservative evangelical kind of upbringing as well? Because from my vantage point, and this is someone who's grown up in the church, but I, I now attend a very progressive church. It's very affirming and accepting of all people. Truly, it would save so many lives if the church would just allow people to live and be who they are and just be loved. So I'm curious if that was also your father's experience. Um, no, he no. did not. <laughs> My mom and dad divorced when I was young and ah. he went down his pathway, which was much more liberal. Mm -hmm. um, and then my mom went down the pathway of being far more conservative as, gotcha. as she progressed in age. And I grew up with my mom and stepdad. And so my dad didn't go that route. Um, and he would agree with that, that we needed to accept people. And that's, that's, you know, I, I dove deep into, uh, into what's called Christian apologetics and mm -hmm. learned the Bible extremely deeply. I, in fact, I was going to spend an entire weekend with Dr. Walter Martin and, uh, where I was the head of the, uh, of the lay ministers for a very large Christian music uh, convention uh -huh. or, or show, festival uh, in Washington state. And uh, he was booked to be there as a speaker. I was going to spend the whole weekend with me. And I thought, this is great. because This is a guy I've read, you know, I've read all his books. I've really, I've studied a lot of what he said. I've listened to his radio show because it was on for years called the Bible answer man. He dies three days before the festival. Oh my gosh. And so they sent, they sent Craig Hawkins to fill in for him. Oh. So I spent the whole weekend with Craig Hawkins and Craig was, uh, was filling in as a Bible answer man for years. Um, you know, as he has one of the on, on, uh, on air people yeah. uh, got to know Craig. Um, but, uh, you know, the thing that I see so much of, and people don't understand this about Christianity, is a vast majority of what is actually taught in any Christian church as cultural. And that the culture, through that lens, they adjust to what they believe in the Bible. There's actually right. so much variation in the Bible that you can believe a lot of things and still be Christian and still yeah. be a good Christian. Yes. You know, yes. it's just take a look at baptism, whether it's sprinkling immersion, there's so much on both sides, but it's an actually an even balance of opinion that you can't say that one or the other is Christian and the other isn't. Yeah. They are both. And so it's like, okay. Um, so that's the depth I went to with it. And um, so it's, you know, it's my dad and I used to have debates about that stuff, but I really wish that he had been, a, I had discovered this sooner before he passed away because we didn't have time to cover everything I really wanted to ask him at that point. Yeah, I imagine. You know, it's just about, you know, how to live life, how to view Christianity, how to view medical stuff, you know, um, because he went through all that. And now um, I've been teaching uh, with our group for six years at UCLA Medical School on transgender patient care. And so I've studied this in great depth because I help teach this to the, the, the medical faculty. Every year I come in with, the, with whatever I can come up with for the latest study results and things like that. And one of the things that I found is 
one i'm uh, my dad and i are extremely rare in that very few uh times where you find a child and a parent be trans mm-hmm. it's very 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 rare most of the yeah. time it's usually a child and has an aunt that is lesbian it's much more common to have that um and then there might be some other folks in the family further out uh they're less directly related they're trans once in a while you'll find find like trans siblings uh those are more common than a parent child and yeah. so um but the one thing we well, that we realize as a community and we know this is that it's it's something we're born with it's not something we choose right and that's right. the problem with uh, a lot of religious folks on of any religion as they are infused with this idea that we choose to be this way, that we want to be uh, the center of attention so that we can have, so, and it's all sexually centered is what they think. Yes. It's not. It's not. We're just trying yet. to live an authentic life and we right. just don't feel comfortable with who we are. And to have anybody else tell us how we are to live is really an anathema to everything. It's like, uh, you know, this country is supposed to be the land of the free and the home of the brave. Freedom means I can choose to be who I want to and live the way I want to and not infringe upon someone else. But yet, when we go to find a job, we're thrown out of it because we're yeah. trans. We're not yeah. even uh, given the chance for an interview because we're trans. So the freedoms that we experience are greatly really curtailed. And yet, many people say, well, that doesn't happen. Oh, yes, it does. Even more in conservative often than Hollywood, it does. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, oh, this is the other thing. A lot of people think that Hollywood's liberal. It's not. Yeah. It's a it's a it's a cross section. <laughs> right. yeah. A lot of a lot of conservative people in Hollywood. Um, you know, a lot of the behind the scenes folks are uh, camera people. Uh, you know, production assistants. A lot of them are conservative. Yeah. Just as much as there are uh, conservative above the line people. You're, your top business people tend to be lean towards conservatism, but not all of them, you know, it's a cross section, but we still don't get jobs and so on. And, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> I could go on and on about that yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's such a difficult thing to navigate, but also I always think, find it funny that people say it's a choice. The only thing that you're choosing is to want to be your authentic self. <laughs> That's the only thing right. you're choosing. Yeah. And so why do I, you know, if you're going to come and tell me what I can, you know, I'm saying this to somebody else, not you, but yeah. <laughs> if, if somebody can come and tell me how I should dress and how I should act, who's telling them that? Yeah. And they're going to go, Nobody. I'm I'm an American. I can I can do what I want. Well, yeah. oh God, give me a break. <laughs> then why are you telling me that? Yeah, you know? it's it's the double standard. It's the double standard for sure. But you know, in you talking about Hollywood, that you know, people have this view that it is, you know, very liberal. I think we we can all say, at least in recent years, we've seen that there has been more conservative conservatism, excuse me, um, and conservatives in Hollywood. They're kind of coming to the forefront with their beliefs and how they're voting. But for you, um, when you're talking about you know trans visibility and the conversation around representation with the trans community in Hollywood, was there a specific moment besides being you know cast and, and realizing there wasn't enough representation was there a specific moment for you when you're like this really needs to change oh <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i think it came when i was asked to help with the dr drew show um because that was in response to the show that was fairly it went viral where um Zoe Turr and Ben Shapiro had their disagreement on live TV, where basically Ben kept goading uh, Zoe by saying, by calling uh, Zoe, who's a uh, well known uh, uh, trans woman. She was in media too, and her name before was Ben Tour. She doesn't mind talking about that either because she was, she was one of the two helicopter pilots that followed uh oj simpson on his low speed ah. white blazer chase throughout hollywood um so she'd been around for a long time and had transitioned openly and then kept calling her him mm-hmm. which honestly when i have an asshole talking to me like that i misgender them right back don't see how they like it i love it um i was just like yeah and it's well i'm a man can't you tell 
I, it's my choice to call you what I want, right? <laughs> you got to turn it around you're on them and see what yep. to call me, so exactly. I can choose what to call you. Yep, you yep. know, I mean, come on, it's a double standard hypocrisy Absolutely. again. Here we come. So anyway, Ben, he, he's goading her like crazy. She finally reaches over and grabs Ben on live TV by the back of the neck and says, "You keep this up, and you're going home in an ambulance." And that, of course, resulted in lawsuits and all of kinds course. of stuff happening because it was assault, you know. And, uh, you know, it's, well, what do you expect? You're talking about a trans woman who served in the military and she had a sort of short fuse, apparently, or one short enough to deal with the shortness of, <laughs> of uh, Ben. By the way, he is really short. I'm, that doesn't part surprise of, me. <laughs> part of why he's got that the way that he is his little man complex yeah i do not respect that guy anymore at all Um, fully understand why (laughs) (laughs) yeah and yet i have family members who worship at his feet i mean it's like what the hell anyway um so they called me in to help deal with this um and uh, i was naturally you know totally fine with with working with uh hln and the dr drew show on figuring navigating this because my dad was in media and so I worked with, uh, with, uh, what was his name? <laughs> uh, the executive producer, Bert Dubrow, um, extensively on planning shows about this. Uh, we originally started with one show idea and we expanded it to two. Once we shared with Bert, the fact that black trans women were being murdered mm-hmm. at an astounding rate back then, it's like almost doubled since then. But, um, he was sat, he sat there in a meeting where he talked to a production meeting and I said, Yeah, you and black trans women being hurt. Or actually somebody else in the meeting brought that up. It was a black trans woman I brought to the meeting. She brought it up with him. And he just sat there with his mouth up and it says, Uh, we're a news organization. Why have we never heard this story before? Wow. So they devoted an entire hour episode of the Dr. Drew show to being trans and of color in the United States. And so uh, I helped develop that one too. So we worked on, you know, the script stuff and planning the audience and getting the people on the stage. I I really worked extensively with that. And I saw all the different disparities that were going on there. And, um, you know, it was really good working with these folks because that's what I like to do is work with media, work with the production people, the behind the scenes folks, as well as the on camera uh, talent to try and navigate this stuff. And I come at it from a business point of view. You know, I'm not doing this from just, I'm not, I am an activist per se, but I do it as trying to be a diplomat rather than being the one who's marching around the building, screaming and holding signs. I'm inside the building negotiating and trying to help the production navigate this minefield of trying to present something that they have no idea about and they can't Mm -hmm. relate to. So I can help bring that perspective to their, to their production. So whether it's script script work you know or helping them with casting helping them with uh you know terminology uh helping educate the other cast members you know whatever it takes that's what we yeah. can do we have done for years now when did you notice there was a shift in there wanting to be more awareness surrounding the transgender community because i do have i have noticed in the last few years that it is a bigger part of the conversation um that it started gradually building um, to give you an idea of how much went on, when I first came down here in 2009, I responded to a help wanted thing on Craigslist for looking for a trans actor. And I responded to it because I had 25 years of uh, directing experience prior to that because I got through film school way back in, in the 1980s. And I think that it's not long. <laughs> but anyway, I went through that, owned a TV production company, then did uh, 25 years of theater. Uh, technical directing so i worked with directing a lot of folks and so i uh didn't you know i, I thought well you know i've directed people why can't i just act because i already know how to tell them to to do these yeah. things and i know what the directors are looking for so uh they responded back and said well we really want somebody with serious training not just somebody like you because we've only had well, maybe a dozen trans people in the last 20 years playing all the trans roles in hollywood which honestly is true and i've met almost all of those 25 (laughs) people now and they're great people and three of them i rep now and so um then about a year later uh we had the whole thing happen with glee and actually a year is in 2014 we had it happen with glee where they wanted 197 trans folks 
for the Glee episode that I was mm-hmm. in. They stuck me right behind Dockery Jones. It was from, uh, so I got famous because I was in the scene heavily. Then um, I was asked by the casting director if I would uh, help find a way for Hollywood to find trans folks. So I did. And that's what we started trans talent out of with some of the people from that uh, that group uh, in the trans and choir. So we started Transgender Talent in early 2015 and, and uh, became a company in May of that year. And uh, at that time, I started with around 35 to 50 people, roughly. I can't remember the exact count. And then um, we were approached by CSA to help start an auditioning program because mm-hmm. they could tell we couldn't, we didn't know how to audition. So we did that in 2016 in June, and we had 70 trans people in that. And not just folks I, I managed, but others. And then about a year after that, that I think it was a year, it might have been a little longer, uh, that they did an open casting call for trans actors. And when they did that, uh, you know, these were all on, on camera folks that came in and did a read with a CSA uh, casting director. Uh, there was about 500 that responded to that. So see wow. how it's growing. Yeah. Uh, now I, I got a hold of uh, CSA's president, uh, uh, Russell Bowes, who's a good friend of mine. Uh, he's, uh, he told me there's about 5,000 now. And so the number of trans actors is growing rapidly, which is what we need because realize, um, we got to know Gary Marsh as well. He's the uh, owner of, uh, and founder of, uh, breakdown, uh, breakdown services, which mm-hmm. owns breakdown express and actors access. And, uh, he told me that like a year ago when I was talking to him, it's just like over a million profiles on their site uh, for actors. And they don't know how many of them are legit or how many were duplicates for the same person. But he said, that's, you know, when you have that many choices, those possibilities, you're going to find what you want when you put on a breakdown. Absolutely. But when you have actors that are supposed to be trans and you put out a breakdown and you only get five, they get kind of lose, lose it or they get nobody. We get that all the time where we get um, major or small productions coming to us and saying, we just put out a casting notice and went through the whole casting cycle, you know, auditions, everything else, we end up with nobody. Why? You know, yeah. so I'm like, oh, let's look at what you did. Let's look what you wrote in your breakdown. Let's find out why nobody responded that fit the, the, the breakdown. Some of them are like a no-brainer. It's like uh, the uh, black trans woman that's 70. We've had like two of those casting calls since I started the company. We have no black trans woman actors that age in the United States. We just had one get a hold of us who's been hiding in Berlin for the last 20 oh, years. Oh, wow. <laughs> She's got a master's in theater acting and she lives in Berlin. Oh, wow. And, you know, so we're uh, working on seeing if we can get her signed mm-hmm. um, because it's like, there's nobody. Yeah. Why? Because the black trans woman average life expectancy in the United States is 35. Oh, wow. But how are you going to have a 70 year old black trans woman actress if, most of them can't live that long. Their life is and then yeah. they didn't have any hope that they could go anywhere with a career like that. So back when I got interviewed at, in, uh, in Rolling Stone, I uh, talked about the fact that we now have hope to move forward with acting careers. So here we are like four years later, because that was published in November 2016. Um, all of a sudden now, this, this latest crop of graduates with BFA degrees getting a bunch of trans people coming through finally. Took them four years, and I don't know if I had any effect on them way back when they were young. I hope I did, yeah. but there's hope now. We can actually go some of their careers, and mostly because we're trying to get trans people not just into trans roles, which are still few and far between, really, into anything else. Yeah. You know, like Emmett Preciado. We got him into good trouble. He's been in... I can't tell you how many episodes they haven't aired them. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but, what, but he's, he's on the show, yes. <laughs> yeah, he's been in seven... Uh, episodes that have aired so far i think it might be eight by now but anyway there's he's in more <laughs> that's wonderful <laughs> and that's a non-transgender role he's playing yeah and you know i was gonna ask though because i think it's safe to make the assumption and i can even speak on this as being a black female in the entertainment industry that sometimes you know agents and managers and casting directors they sort of treat marginalized groups as if they're just a checkbox you know, so what are you doing in order to stop that kind of behavior of just them filling a quota, but actually just honoring the talents of an underrepresented group? 
Uh, that's a really easy one, but it's the hardest thing to do. Um, I saw this the very first few months I started my company, and that is we needed to get people in above the line positions who are from those minority or marginalized groups, because then they can speak to that and help have an actual effect on the production. Mm -hmm. If they're below the line, and by below the line, I mean, they're the grunts who come in and do the work. So that's your yeah. production system, your camera operators, your, you know, you're not your, your, uh, your, uh, uh, on camera talent, director of photography, yeah. but you yeah. know, your, all yeah. your other yeah. folks. So yeah. anyway, it's uh, the above the line folks actually have a say in the creative process. And so that's what we've been trying to do is get people in above the line. So we've been trying to work hard to, you know, because this is the thing that happens that's kind of a non-spoken non thing in Hollywood. <laughs> it, everybody knows it, but they don't talk about it much from what I can tell. Maybe I'm wrong on this, but it's it seems like when you have somebody from a marginalized group above the line, you don't have to have a watchdog on set representing that group. Mm. Because you've got somebody there all the time already, this part yeah. of the project. Yeah. So you don't have to have it, you know, and honestly, executive producers get driven up a wall by watchdogs um, because there's you've got the if you're in the majors, you've got watchdogs from the major studio or major network breathing down your neck every single day, giving you notes. And you don't need a bunch of other ones added to that craziness, making it you know, that you have to negotiate with and figure out how you're going to change things to fit what they're telling you you have to do. So if you've got somebody above the line who's in the marginalized group. They're already speaking to that, so there isn't going to be any conflicts, potentially. So that's what we're trying to do is get the folks in above the line anywhere we can. So we are working on expanding our connections all over the top of the industry and have done so. We've met with a lot of CEOs, vice presidents, heads of casting, of networks, of major studios, all that stuff to try and get people in to above the line positions. We're working on trying to get folks in. Uh, as uh, as co-writers on on projects, we're trying to get people in as producers. We're trying to get them in as executives, and so this is where you can actually make a difference when that happens. And this yeah. is nothing new. We're following a pattern that works because that's how the gay community got into Hollywood. Yeah, they started doing that in the in the seventies, and they made a difference. So by the time it got to the nineties. They were in those upper level positions and could actually speak to it and make those adjustments. It's still not perfect, but at least they have their foot in the door. And they didn't come up with that idea. You know who did? Lucy and Desi. Ah. Because they were a couple that was not of the same culture. Yeah. And they celebrated it. Yeah. They were the ones who inspired folks like uh, the... Uh, a couple they just did that oh the loving couple who yep. ended up fighting uh for the right to Be marry married. uh anybody of any race yeah and it fought they fought all the way to supreme court and they won and it's yeah. funny that they won that that case right around the time that all the major lgbt riots started happening because i think they won the case in 67 and yeah so it wasn't that long ago <laughs> yeah you had the black cat riot uh, the compton riot and yeah. the, um and stonewall happened in the next couple of years after that so that's wow. that's so this idea is not new it works yeah. Yeah, yeah but what it does is it, it it you start from the ground up like that bringing in folks who could actually make a difference and have the training and have the patience and understanding which is what we've been demonstrating teaching students at UCLA. Oh my God, we've got a thousand <laughs> of them. And we've been asked everything under the sun and we don't get offended anymore. You can come and ask me anything and it doesn't bother me because I've already been asked everything you can dream yeah, of. Yeah, I can only imagine. You know, but I do love that you're using your voice outside of the entertainment industry to educate people because that's kind of also where the biggest problem lies yeah. with ignorance and lack of education. It's really just your regular everyday people, but I'm sure in the medical community, it is a struggle with finding proper care for the transgender community. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had one of our uh, folks who've been on several of the panels we do there over the years, he uh, moved to Ohio and he went to him for a doctor's appointment 
and the doctor walks in big eye i remember you from ucla this is in ohio you know <laughs> i've been trying to change this clinic and make everybody ask pronouns when they come in and treat you guys with respect oh Good that's up. great that's wonderful yeah so, so for you I know we talked about getting more people from the transgender community and above the line positions. Is that what like full scale representation looks like to you or what else would full scale representation of your community entail? Um, it would be getting us into roles that where we're not discussing trans so much and this, and our transition and all this, we're people, we play roles, we do jobs. And it's not I the mean, only part of your story. Yeah, it's just a small part of it, really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, society forces it to be a big part because we have to hide it. And we have to work to meet certain goals because if we are too open looking as trans, we'll get attacked in public, which still happens all over the country every yeah. day. It's not reported in media much, but all this anti everything that's been uh, stirred up by one and i was watching uh, i was watching the uh the the january 6th uh commission mm -hmm. uh meetings on a uh, live stream and the, well, one of the one of the police officers literally called those people terrorists on uh, there i literally can't disagree with that more yeah. but that kind of terrorism from a, gra a grassroots level is what's causing so much damage and it's really crazy, you know, the, 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 that before the 19th century, trans people were not attacked. In fact, we were respected in almost every culture of the world because we are everywhere. And we have been for centuries, for millennia. The earliest known trans person I know of was from 3,600 years ago. Hmm. One of the pharaohs of Egypt. <laughs> and that's only come out in recent years yeah, of that with wow. Zion Wass's research on it. And so, um, and every other society on the planet has major trans people in them. And uh, it's like many of the, uh, the shaman in Native American societies were transgender because mm -hmm. they could relate to both genders. Yeah. And so, um, you know, and, and they were well respected, but in the 19th century, uh, it, it started really fomenting, guess where? In yep. the UK, <laughs> in England. <laughs> and so what did they do? They, you know, they ruled the world. Their son never set on their, 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 their uh, kingdom. And they stuck that in the colonial laws back in the 19th century and spread their crap all over the world. All over the world. <laughs> and then um, and there's, we're still dealing with it. It was not a part of the Muslim tradition to hate trans people. It wasn't part of Christianity. It wasn't part of Judaism. It was influence. It was an outside influence injected into our religions by the British yep. in the 19th century, early 19th century is where it starts showing up. And by the time it hit Queen Victoria, oh my God, everybody's got to wear high neck shirts and uh, it, it became crazy. You know, so this is what we're fighting against is literally centuries of misinformation mm. brought to us thanks to the British. It's all baloney. Yeah. We, aren't, we aren't trying to usurp women by uh, i'm not you know come on right it, that that view is, is something that definitely needs to change but as we do move into this new generation of breaking down societal norms and kind of how we define gender and sexuality and basically anything that we've been conditioned to believe what do you feel needs to change the most in terms of stereotypes that are thrown towards the transgender community specifically uh the most oh, <laughs> Take any of the stereotypes that have been applied to black people, Chinese people, even the Irish. If you go back far enough, yeah. it's a batch of stereotypes they throw at any group they hate. So, you know, or the gay community, that's the most recently where they've used that as we're all pedophiles. Mm. Uh-huh. Yeah, right. We're but we're pedophiles. Uh how about all the religious leaders who've gone to jail for it? How about all the members of Congress and the Senate, both state and federal, who've been uh, convicted of sexual assault in public restrooms? Mm. There hasn't been a single one perpetrated anybody, anywhere by a trans person that I know of. 
And yet all of those groups that love to throw mud at us have done it ad, <laughs> ad nauseum. <laughs> right. You know, it's like, right. yeah, it's, it's called projecting. They're taking their crap and projecting it on us. Yes. Um, so it, we're not pedophiles. We're not in this for sex. We're not in this for um, trying to usurp women or, or men. Uh, we're not, you know, all this stuff is baloney and we're not a threat to society. The people who are violent are the people who are spreading this stuff around constantly. So even if they're sitting in their mansion somewhere typing on Twitter, all this crap about us, yeah. they're still being violent yeah. by spreading this violence and inciting others to hate us. Uh, it's such it's so frustrating because at the end of the day if somebody else's life isn't affecting you just leave them alone and i wish more people would just take that route <laughs> well and i think everything you are doing is amazing i love what you've built i love the story behind it can you please let people know where they can find you and follow the work that you're doing okay we have a couple of websites the main one is transgendertalent.com um and that's where we try and post most everything, although I'm really slow in getting it there. Then we have our, we started a music division recently called Key Change Ensemble. And we have a website for that. It's keychangeensemble.org. So they can go and take a look at us there. We also have uh, social media stuff, but I don't post anything on there except like announcements. So uh, we just don't want to deal with this stuff on social media because it's it. so out of control everywhere. Yeah. We haven't found one social media outlet that's doing it right. Yeah. Um, so we have Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, both for my personal accounts and company accounts on all of those. Uh, I can't remember where else we have it because I don't post much. <laughs> but the websites are the main places to yeah, check out your the way, that's Yeah, that's, that's where it is. So, right. Anyway. Well, it was wonderful chatting with you. Thank you so much for sharing your story and and everything that you're accomplishing for your community. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And to the listeners, make sure you subscribe to We Need to Talk. And we'll talk to you again real soon. Bye. Bye.